Good morning, Fellowship Church. We're so glad you've decided to join us this morning. We hope you sing, no matter where you are, your kitchen, your living room, um, that you would gather together as a family and sing his praises. Savior's coming again, church. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call every sin, wake up the same. Jesus Christ. 
Good morning, Fellowship Church. Welcome to Fellowship Church Online. It's good to see you. I just want to say welcome. I'm so glad that you have woken up this morning. This is a day to rejoice in for the Lord has made it. I just want to give you a few announcements. The first one is we have continued online services available for you throughout the week. I don't know about you, but I'm a little sore from trying to do push-ups without any arms. If you happen to see Brandon leading refuge through exercise, that was really exciting. We also have P. Rob that's continuing to do lessons online for our children's ministry. We have our path groups who continue to meet um, online going through the sermon series. So we just want to encourage you to continue going online so that we can stay connected. Um, and at this time, I would also like to invite Travis Mitchell, our mayor, up. He's going to give us a, a few updates along with our Pastor Jonathan. Good morning, Fellowship Church. I hope y'all are doing well this morning. It is an honor for us to be joined once again by our beloved mayor, Mayor Travis Mitchell. Um, mayor, I know there have been some important updates, particularly a study put out by UT this past week. We'd love to hear about it. Thank you, Pastor. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to come up and talk after a song encouraging the church to wait. Uh, I feel like that's a... Uh, I feel like you didn't just come up with that randomly, did you guys? That was a good one. Uh, it's hard to speak after that. God but, um, intervened. And was right. Yeah, the, uh, the Bible talks about not forsaking the gathering, gathering of uh, the brethren, speaking of the church generally, and, and that's certainly challenging right now. And I feel it because I'm fortunate with just a couple people around here to, to experience what it means to worship in a church. 
uh, with people uh, gathered together, and I know that's just one more sacrifice we're having to make because um, it's a special and spiritual thing, right. and churches all over the country and, and certainly here in Kyle are, um, are struggling because mm-hmm. they want to be together, especially during a time of, uh, of immense crisis, but yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm speaking about faith instead of uh, the coronavirus, but it's just I, I heart, echo so. those sentiments. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly <laughs> with you. <laughs> so, um, if you want to repeal anything, I would just gather everybody yes, together. Yeah. And, I'm uh, still thinking just, about <laughs> the, the request you made. We'll 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 keep it under consideration. So, uh, earlier this week, the University of Texas, the medical department, and their leading medical experts released a. Uh, a study focused on what's called the Austin MSA, which is the mm-hmm. five-county Austin region. Uh, we're really fortunate at the University of Texas. In 2012, researchers developed what they called a uh, pandemic planning tool. Uh, there are there are uh, leading experts in Austin fo- that have been focused for a decade or more uh, on mapping and tracking the the spread of an epidemic. Uh, just like what we have with COVID-19. And that's great for us because it gives us a authoritative, not perfect, but valuable tools to help us understand what's coming and the impact that we can make on that through various um, uh, uh, initiatives. The, the initiatives that we have in Kyle and that we are experiencing throughout the region are obviously extremely uh, challenging. They, yeah. They're taking, uh, it takes an enormous toll on us to try and implement those protocols. Yeah. Uh, essentially, what it has concluded is, uh, based on the data that they had a few days ago, uh, that, the, that the virus is doubling uh, of confirmed cases every four days, uh, that about 18% of those who contract the disease are asymptomatic, meaning mm-hmm. they don't exhibit any of the normal symptoms associate that we're, we're thinking of when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, and uh, are on at least on some level capable still of transmitting the disease. Uh, the report said that if we continue uh, with a normal amount of social distancing, including the cl- closing of schools, reducing our non-household contacts by as much as 50%, yeah. uh, that the hospitals in the region will uh, exceed demand by May. Okay. So it's a grim outlook. The good news is uh, the the outlook says if we can reduce our what they call non-household touch points by as much as 90%, uh, then we can flatten the curve all the way to the point of keeping our hospitals from being overwhelmed. Right. And really, at the end of the so day... So there is some hope. There is hope. Right. Yeah, right. it's not easy. So uh, what, what does a non-household touch So I- if you think about your family unit, uh, which normally, but it's not, doesn't have to be, is normally uh, 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 parents and children, mm-hmm. that's a household. So the, the touches in between a household are not the primary focus of the yeah. study, and it's not what the study is primarily focused on trying to eliminate, though you want to be careful. I still uh, obviously uh, touch my children, give mm-hmm. them hugs. Uh, it, that's certainly very important, but uh, you know, I'm trying to refrain from... Um, you know, being too close, and mm-hmm. we're trying to make sure that we keep good sanitizing practices. The important thing to think about, though, is the is eliminating the contacts drastically, drastically outside of that uh, that family unit. And if you think about it, every point, I- every uh, person within a household has the ability to touch outside the household. That's children touching other children, other mm-hmm. children's toys. That's parents touching a gas station door. Yeah, it's, a, it's challenging for everyone to try to reduce their non-household touches by 90%. But mm-hmm. essentially, that's the mission. That's, mm-hmm. that's really the first and, and primary mission that everyone needs to have. We want to reduce our non-household touches by 90%. And if you're in a situation where you do touch something uh, outside of your household, you need to not touch your face and not touch other things until you have cleaned your hands. So it's not even necessarily the best practice to say I'm going to touch this and not touch my hands and then touch this and not touch my hands and touch this and not touch my hands and then wash my hands because you have still spread germs among multiple Mm. touches. 
the, 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 the necessity of good hygiene and not allowing your household unit to spread germs to other households is a matter of life and death. Mm. It's a matter of are we going to overwhelm our hospitals or not? And so okay. uh, I believe that it's possible. Okay. Man, thank you for that word. I know it does our soul good to just be connected as a church with what is going on. We are praying for you um, and praying for the burden. I know that's upon your shoulders as you've had to make very difficult decisions. Um, in fact, here uh, we're going to invite Pastor Paul Valdez to come back up, and I know that he's going to pray for you and pray for our government as we continue walking in this very strange um, time. But I know this, even though it's a strange and difficult time, uh, God is still moving, and God is still working in our lives. So praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Church, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to open it up to Job chapter 28. Job continues through great suffering, and he is wondering, where is wisdom? And I cannot think of a more appropriate time for us to be asking that same question. Thank you, Mayor Mitchell, for your word, and we do pray for wisdom over you and all of those who are in positions of leadership. Job 28 says, Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from the ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches out to the farthest limit, the ore in gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where everyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and it has dust of gold. That path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud beasts have not trodden it, the lion has not passed over it. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eyes see every precious thing. He dams up the streams so that they do not trickle, and the thing that is hidden he brings out to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed at its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or so sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold from where then does wisdom come and where is the place of understanding it is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air abaddon and death say we have heard a rumor of it with our ears god understands the way to it and he knows its place for he looks to the ends of the earth and he sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and he declared it and he established it and searched it out. And he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Father God, we declare that you, you are the giver of wisdom. And oh, Lord Jesus, how we need your wisdom right now. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would impart understanding and wisdom to the leaders of our community, to the leaders of this county, this state, and this nation. Father God, we thank you that you have given us your word. Lord Jesus, continue to 
moved in our midst. Speak to us through Pastor Jonathan as he opens up your word, Lord Jesus. Help us to be wise. Give us your understanding, God. We ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
amazing grace, so sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Who I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Come in church. And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, and I see your scars, your rope and arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I live in my voice and everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. We have a hope this morning, church. How great. 
Break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. And the work is finished, the end is written. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, cause I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. We praise you and we thank you for being our living hope. Father, in this time, those words are so necessary and so important. Lord, you are alive. You breathe hope into our lives, Father. You're the hope for our nation. You're the hope for our city. Father, you're the hope for our families. 
And Lord, we thank you that you have embedded that hope into our hearts through faith because Jesus Christ, you've risen from the dead. Lord, you have conquered sin and death itself. Lord, what's left? We thank you so much, Father, for an opportunity to praise you, even through uh, this medium of, of uh, the internet and Facebook Live. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to worship you right where we are. We praise you and we bless the name of Jesus. In that wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. I am so glad that you could be joining us today. Um, if you haven't been receiving the announcements ahead of time, at the end of this sermon, we are going to take the Lord's Supper together. And so if you want to put this on pause and take a few moments to um, gather a few items for the end of this time, um, that would be a blessing. That would be great. Um, I want you to be reminded, church, that this is not the church. Um, what we are doing here is not the church. Uh, we are producing worship for you to watch in your living room. And um, I'm delivering a message to you. And praise the Lord again for the Internet and for the way he's given us the opportunity to connect at least this way. But this is not the church. Uh, the church, by definition, in the original language is an ecclesia, which, which literally means called out ones. So by its definition, we are called out of the world and group up together. We stand together. And in that unity together, there's a testimony to the rest of the world. And for this time, I don't know what the Lord is um, wanting out of this time. I know that he's working. I know that he's moving. But for this time, God has called us to stand on our own with our families. How are you doing with that stand? Well, I hope that you've taken advantage of the time that you have with your family. It's a, a time, as the Lord told Hezekiah, to get his house in order. Are you using this time to get your house in order? You know, for so many of you, you use, you've used an excuse to say, I don't have time to read my Bible or to pray. You've been afforded that time over the last few weeks. Are you taking advantage of that time? I know in the last two weeks, my family has eaten together around a table probably more in two weeks than we did the rest of the year before that. Uh, I'm a little bit ashamed to confess that to you right now. But I know we were wrong in getting away from it the way we had to allow our schedule to pull into that family time. And it's been so sweet to fellowship with one another around the table to use that time to talk about the Lord and what he's doing in our life to get our house in order. But I want you to hear my heart in this. It is my heart to get us back together as soon as worldly possible, once again, to be the church together again, because we know there's a power of the Holy Spirit um, when we are, are communicating together. That's Quinonia Fellowship, the fellowship of the Spirit within us. So as soon as we can, my plan is, is to get us, if, if it's outside, we're going to meet outside. If it's inside, we're going to meet outside, um, and we are certainly praying for wisdom, for when that day comes. And oh, what a day that will be. You know, I believe that day will be a glimpse of what heaven will be for us. I thought I would turn around and find my stool, but I didn't find it. <laughs> but it's coming up here right now. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. What a day it will be in heaven. You know, in the book of Revelation, we've had many glimpses into heaven itself. Um, so since August, we have been walking through the book of Revelation. And we've come to the end now in this climactic part, which is heaven. Praise the Lord. And we've already seen many glimpses into heaven in Revelation, but now what we are going to see is the establishment 
of our place in heaven. Well, what's that going to be like? Boy, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? What will heaven be like? Uh, I want to put a word into your head as to what heaven will be like that maybe you haven't thought before. I think it's going to be like fulfilled romance. Romance. Now, you might be rolling your eyes right now, sitting on your couches at home, and, and men especially, I don't want you to check out because sometimes we hear romance, we think of a Hallmark movie, and then we're already out the door, right? We're not thinking about it. But men, even we love romance when we think about how uh, uh, somebody is rescued, right? Uh, it's great to think of a man coming to the rescue. Everybody likes that. And oh, what an incredible rescue story this is beginning here in Revelation 19. But for us to understand this ending, I, I want us to know the beginning. Why were we created in the first place? Uh, because this is so important for us as, as we think about what is going on here in the end in heaven. You know, any good Bible scholar will tell you, well, we're created for the glory of God. And yes, I agree 100% we were created for the glory of God, but all of creation is for the glory of God. The rocks on the ground are created for the glory of God. The trees, the birds, the, the ocean, all of that is created for the glory of God. When we talk about us as human beings, there's something even more specific, isn't there? We were created for a relationship with God. Yes, to give Him glory but created to, to relate personally to Almighty God. And we see it from the very beginning. In, in Genesis chapter 2, remember, God breathes into the dust of the ground and he creates Adam. And what does he tell Adam? He tells him how to honor him in his life. And then the very next thing he says, Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. And so what does God do? He reaches into the side of Adam and he pulls out a rib and he fashions from what was Adam, from his very rib, he fashions a bride. For Adam. And as soon as this woman is created, Eve, what does God tell Adam and Eve in verse 24 of chapter 2? He says, Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. See, he, he wrote relationship into the fabric of our being. Right? It, Adam, this is why I created you. Eve, this is why I created you for relationship. Now, what is God showing us? Well, as the church, what are, what are we called as the church? Well, we're called the body of Christ. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 27, Paul tells us, Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. So individually, we're members, but when we come together, there's something much greater than ourselves. We are the body of Christ. So what else are we called? We're called the bride of Christ. Right again in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 2, Paul says, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So, which one is it? Uh, are we the body or are we the bride? It's the same as Adam and Eve, right? We, we've already seen this taking place. Haven't we? We've seen a picture of it. Are we the body or are we the bride? See, let's think about this. If, if God is eternal, we think about all of his divine attributes, then how can God create something that he is going to have a relationship with? It, it should be impossible because whatever he creates is not going to be like him. It's not going to be eternal. It's not going to have the attributes of him. So there's going to be a problem in the relationship, right? Unless God creates his body, and he can reach into that body and pull forth a bride, a bride that is eternal just like him, a bride that is pure and righteous and holy just like him. We are the body of Christ. 
we are the bride of Christ. And we've seen this put together even in the book of Genesis right up front in chapter 2. And the reason I want to walk through that stuff with you this morning was that what we're going to see take place in Revelation chapter 19 began in Genesis. What we're going to see take place in heaven was put into motion when the foundations of the earth were laid into place. Now listen, I guess we jumped into the deep end this morning a little bit with some theologic thought. What an incredible love story God has put into place. I love a great love story, especially when it's about me, right? I I love uh, being in love with my wife, with Elizabeth. Man, when Elizabeth and I met, we met in in a movie theater in in Killeen, Texas, watching a, a movie that was not even memorable. We left halfway through the movie to get a Coke at the concession stand, and man, we were hooked after that. We we were together after that. I would say very much it was love at first sight with Elizabeth and I. At least for me. It was love for me at first sight. I, I might have had to win her over a little bit over lots of Cokes at the concession stand, but um, regardless, it was love, right? And I love hearing the stories about how you've gotten together with the people that, that you love. I, 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 my favorite kind to hear about are the people who, one, one of them doesn't realize that they love the other person. And, but then they, they realize that the other person has been going to such great lengths and sacrifices to be with the other person and to show them and to, to lay down their life for them and to love them. And they realize, oh my goodness, this person really loves me and I really love them too. I, I love those stories because it reminds me of God. You see, look at this with creation. God has loved you from the beginning, from the very beginning. If you have your Bibles, look in Revelation chapter 19. What has happened up until this point in Revelation? Well, what we read in the last two chapters is that Babylon has been destroyed. Babylon, who would be the pinnacle of of evil upon the earth, the city that represents evil and that evil has come out from to, to corrupt the rest of the earth. Babylon has been destroyed. Now, in verse in chapter 17 and 18, we've been seeing that destruction on earth and celebrating it. But now in chapter 19, as John has done throughout the book of Revelation, now we get a glimpse in heaven where we're celebrating the same thing. But we start to see quickly in chapter 19, there's even greater revelation than what we've known in chapter 17 and 18 because all of this has been happening for you and for me. God has orchestrated all of this for the relationship he wants with you and with me. In verse 1, John says, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And we know that great prostitute is the city of Babylon. This begins with a a cry of hallelujah. Now, uh, it's such an incredible word. We see that word hallelujah throughout the Old Testament. Um, It might surprise you that that word is never in the New Testament until we get to the book of Revelation. And every time we see it in the book of Revelation, it is at the top of this great hymn or great praise chorus of worship to the Lord. Indeed, the word literally means praise Yahweh or praise the one and only God. We're seeing this as our establishment of our place in heaven. And so I want you to write this down on your notes. You can find the message notes on our website if you have trouble finding them. 
Uh, this is the first thing. Jesus is the one, right? Here's what we're realizing in heaven right at the beginning of chapter 19. Jesus is the one. Uh, now, that's going to become more and more clear as these verses go on, but what we're doing here in verses 1 and 2, we're praising him for deliverance. We're praising him for his salvation, for his glory, and, and for the honor that is due him. After all, this whole book is a revelation of Jesus Christ. You say, well, this is about praising God. But everything in this book was put in place, remember, because Jesus was worthy to put it in place. Because Jesus was worthy to enact this plan of God. Right? We're thinking romance here. Can you imagine yourself in this large banquet hall and, and a band is playing and maybe people are dancing and it's, and it's crowded and there's distractions, but then suddenly your eyes meet the one on the other side of the room, the one that you've been looking for, and, and your eyes are fastened upon each other and neither one of you wants to break the stare from the other person. And suddenly it doesn't matter what music is playing, it doesn't matter who is talking around you, it doesn't matter who else is in the room around you, all that matters is that you have found the one and that person has found you you're the only one it, isn't this cool here that Jesus is looking at you the way you would look at him and say he is the one he is the object of my desire and in this banquet hall Jesus has orchestrated all of it to be with you. Look in verse 3. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The smoke from Babylon, from its destruction, is going up forever and ever. And here's the second thing I want you to write down, is that the platform for evil to stand upon has been destroyed. Right? The platform, which is Babylon, it's been destroyed. And so another way to say it, the staging ground of what has caused us to stumble and fall and become unrighteous and unholy, that staging ground has been destroyed forever. Babylon has been judged. So hear this, God saw the world. He saw it accurately. He saw it for what it was and he judged the world in righteousness. And rightly, in every decision that he made. Well, we talk about God choosing his bride. This is so important. He chose us. And he judged Babylon. He chose righteousness and holiness. And he recognized what was unrighteous and that was destroyed. He loves you, and he chooses you. I, I know sometimes when we talk about God choosing, people become uncomfortable because they uh, uh, go back to kindergarten, and when you were, had your backs against the dugout in kindergarten, and everybody was playing kickball, and the most popular kids in kindergarten were sitting on the pitcher's mound, and they were picking the kids on the dugout, and some of you hate that because you were chosen last, and it just was so awkward, wasn't it, in kindergarten of, oh, I like you. You've got the strongest leg. Oh, I want you on my team. You're the fastest, and even though you might have been the smartest person in class, you were picked last because the smarts just don't matter in kickball, right? And all of us deal sometimes with just that, oh, I haven't been chosen. But if that's where you go to when you, when you understand that God chose his bride, then you're wrong. Because listen, before you even knew there was a game, God called out into the darkness and rescued you out of darkness into his glorious light. That's the choosing of the Lord. He chose those who didn't deserve it to be elevated in his righteousness for his glory. 
to be in relationship with him. And listen, this platform of evil being destroyed, it is complete. So you don't have to worry about some partner cutting in again between you and Jesus. And don't think for a second that I'm talking about Jesus being unfaithful with some other partner. We're the ones that are always unfaithful. But here with the destruction of Babylon, we don't have to worry about the temptation of another partner again because that platform has been destroyed. Look in verse 4 of chapter 19. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Isn't this worship incredible? Listen, here's the third thing that's so important for us to know that we're understanding about us in heaven is that worship is the love language of the relationship between you and God. Worship is the language that we speak. I know many of you have bought and read Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages. I know it's one of my favorite books, and I recommend it to marriages all the time. And basically, he goes through that book, and he says, as a person, you respond to different types of things. And, uh, you know, I really believe that there's more than five love language in, in studying it. And I do believe that we share a, a lot of different ones here on this earth. But uh, the book is so important to understanding how your spouse ticks to understanding what, what makes them click in their heart and in their mind. And, and maybe you've struggled with that in your relationship, but when you discover it, oh man, how important that is. You know, when Elizabeth and I were first married, um, I thought she would love me if I did the work around the house. So man, I, I was vacuuming, I was cleaning the bathroom, and uh, she noticed it, and I know that she appreciated it, but there just wasn't a lot of love expressed because of that work that I was doing. And then I came to find out months into our marriage that she loves gifts. And I realized, you mean if I bring you a card from Walgreens or, or a flower from H-E-B or, or something like that, that that means more to you than all of the work that I've been doing around the house? Well, yes. Because that's the way that, that she's geared in her heart. Whoa! You talk about a life changer. Elizabeth, I'm sorry that I haven't given you the gifts that I'm talking about right now. I just need to get that confession off of my heart. Uh, listen, we learn right here the love language of God, and this is so important. Church, you have to be excellent at worship of our God. There's no excuse. This is not a spiritual gift that some are equipped with and others aren't. I'm not talking about your voice. I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking about your ability to focus in on God, your ability to exalt Him with every aspect of your life, your ability to hear His voice as you exalt Him and you walk with Him. Just like Adam and Eve would walk in the cool of the evening with God in the garden, he wants to walk with you. He wants you to know his voice. He wants to hear your voice in praise of him. I wonder, even as this incredible worship band was, was lifting God up in worship earlier, I wonder if you were laying on the couch halfway putting yourself into it or if you were on your feet giving God the praise that he's due. How is your worship of the living God? Look in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. 
for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Woo! How incredible this is. God has chosen marriage as a way to describe how he wants to be with you and with me. God has chosen the word marriage to describe what heaven is going to be like for you and for me with him. So the last thing I want you to write down. The holy lamb marries the righteous saints. Now let's make no mistake, who is the lamb? Well, he's been identified 28 times already in the book of Revelation. This is Jesus, the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Who is the bride? Again, make no mistake, in the Bible, this is the church. Now, some of you might be squirming on your couch right now when you say the Holy Lamb marries the righteous saints. And Jonathan, you were talking about that earlier, how God has chosen his righteous ones. But you might be looking at your own heart and realizing, wait, I'm not righteous. I look in the mirror and I remember what I did yesterday. I I wake up and I remember what what my life was like two years ago, ten years ago, and my life is filthy with sin. Don't be mistaken, church. This is the glory of God. Look in Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. The Bible says, Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, there is no distinction. Praise the Lord. The righteousness isn't built on you. It's not built on what you've done. The righteousness that you need for a relationship with God was built on what Jesus Christ has done for you. And that righteousness is yours by faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Look in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Paul says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when we become worried that our deeds aren't righteous, listen, in Christ Jesus, he is doing a work in us, right? So that that work in us can produce the deeds of righteousness that we see glorified right here in Revelation 19 in the marriage supper of the Lamb. I just want to mention a a rabbit here for a second. The fact that this is celebrating the righteous deeds of the church is testimony to me that this is after the judgment seat of Christ because works that aren't righteous are burned up in the fire in the judgment seat of Christ. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it because we're going to talk about this in our next in-depth session on Sunday night. In fact, uh, you might want to take time later to look in Ephesians chapter 5. This is not the rabbit anymore. In Ephesians chapter 5 in in verses um, 25 through 32, the Lord talks about husbands and and he talks about marriage itself and and how what God has put into place through Adam and Eve with a husband and a wife is more than just about this world, about loving each other and living together, that that he said, no, all of this has been written to, to foreshadow the church and Jesus Christ and something greater that is coming. God is preparing us in this earth for something greater that is to come. Some of you have wondered why in your marriage, you say, it seems like my marriage refines me more than it does just make me happy. That's because God is preparing us. He's shaping us to be the bride that he wants. Now you look in these verses, they're praising the Lord. I love this in verse 6. They're praising the Lord for his uh, omnipotence because he's almighty. I love the King James Version. He says, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. 
I love that because that's the way that George Handel, <laughs> George Frederick Handel wrote it in his great oratorio, The Messiah. They're praising God because he is almighty and reigning. But listen, they're praising God because the bride is ready. They're praising God because you are ready in this day and age. How important is the bride? The heavens are praising because we have been made ready in this time. And, and husbands, maybe you can relate to this. Oh, we understand how important the bride is. You want to see a husband get mad? You talk bad about his bride. You talk bad about his wife, and that's going to stir up a, a holy, righteous anger in any husband upon this earth. Boy, this should give us great pause. Church, how many people do you know that talk bad about the church? I'm not just talking about fellowship church. How many people do you know that talk bad about the church? Be careful. That's the bride of Christ. How important is the bride? You know, this is all so amazing here in verse 10 that John says this, Then I fell down at his feet, at the angel's feet, to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, how important the bride is, how important the groom is. He says everything that has been spoken at the, from the past up until this point has led and pointed to this time where the bride marries the groom. What a story. What a romance. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day that is going to be. For us, Yes, it's going to be nice for us all to get together, but to be with Jesus. Oh, how incredible a day that will be. For when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And when we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory. Bless the Lord. What a day that will be. Are you getting ready for this day? Do you know throughout the last 2,000 years of the church, one of the ways that Jesus has given us to be ready for that final day is the Lord's Supper. And what we're doing when we partake of the Lord's Supper is that we are participating in something that Jesus gave us to participate in. In fact, Paul tells us about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, in verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you are a Christian this morning, then I invite you to take the bread, just like I'm holding here in my hand, and even across these computer screens and TV screens this morning, as a united body of Christ, we remember the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us. This body that Isaiah tells us in chapter 53 healed us by the stripes upon his back. And we remember this body broken for us, and it... And it prioritize, right? It, it puts our mind back into what is most important to love Jesus and to realize what he has done for us is our righteousness and our healing. Let's eat of this bread together. Father, we thank you for your body. We thank you that by it we've been healed. 
Lord, we thank you that um, you were willing to be broken for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, so that we might be shaped into a pure and holy bride. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul continues to tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, here in verse 25, it says, In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And listen, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In this cup, we see what is like the blood of Jesus, the blood of the new covenant that washes our sins away and makes us new. Do you drink this cup with me? And Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you that it was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, that um, no matter what we've done, no matter how we've done it, that there was nothing that we have done that is too great of a price that wasn't covered on the cross of Jesus. Lord, your death has satisfied the payment for our sins. So we thank you for the, the blood of a new covenant, Lord, that by faith we can be made righteous through your blood. Father, we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And church, I can't imagine a better thing to do after we take the Lord's Supper together than to worship the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Where you are, would you stand with us and let's proclaim out with one voice the glory of our Lord and Savior. this week that you do, if you have some more time than you usually do, that you would dive into our Savior. 
that for every one look you look at a news station or a website, you would, you would give a hundred looks to Jesus this week. We love you, church. Come back. I know there is peace within your presence.